Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege and an honor to be asked to present the uh, closing remarks on this particular uh, conference that we've just had. As you can see, we were talking about the latest developments in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, over the period in late December 2016. One of the questions that was asked of us during the course of the conference is, are we in an era of change? Well, of course, we've said this I don't know how many times, but actually probably more telling is the comment, actually, we're in a change of era. The whole structure of everything we previously have seen and known is likely to change and we move into a new era entirely. Next slide, please. I'd like to pay tribute, as if I may, to all the contributors, and I've listed them all here. Uh, they've all, in their own way, given us a very telling and incisive way of looking at the world in their particular areas of concern. I think we've had a very good cross-section, and I would like to thank each and every individual one of them for their contribution. Could I also, at the bottom, uh, thank on behalf of all of you, the ERPIC members who've also contributed, uh, Dr. Kleakos Kiriakides, Mr. Gary Lakes, and Captain Lars Wedin. But uh, not least, I should also ask you to thank, on uh, my behalf and our behalf, all the members of ERPIC who've made this particular dialogue possible. And I'm thinking here, of course, uh, Chris uh, Pelagias, Christian, and of course, Marta. Without their contribution, of course, none of this would have taken place. Next slide, please. I want to pick out in my closing comments some common themes. So if I don't actually mention your name and your particular topic, it's not because I uh, disregard it or undervalue it. It's because it didn't necessarily resonate with some of the other presentations. But these are some of the common themes that have actually come up, and I think they're quite interesting. The first is over the balance of power. And I think we should realize that the balance of power is actually changing, is in, as in terms of the change of era. Europe now, with relatively small armies, very small uh, commitments financially, uh, is less and less interested in anything except those areas covered by Article 5, i.e. the NATO countries or the European countries. Under President Obama, the United States seems to have been reluctant to become committed, and one thinks particularly about the situation in Syria. The United Kingdom, sadly, because I am British, after Brexit is fixated only now on withdrawal from the European Union, and it is difficult now to get any sense out of the Brits, and it may well continue that way for probably a couple of years. The United States' future, of course, is very uncertain. Uh, Mr. Trump has come to power and given his, uh, his, us his foreign policy, and it's going to be an America-first foreign policy. He says he will use force if necessary, but it will be force in America's interest only. He is not going to be the world's policeman. And then we look at international institutions that are slowly losing their authority, the United Nations, obviously, but the International Criminal Court and even the UNCLOS Tribunal come to mind. The next uh, consideration that we need to have in mind is that given the, this withdrawal, this de facto withdrawal, there seems to be an increasing vacuum in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean. Well, what effect does that have? Well, as we can see, the old powers that used to be there in large numbers, the British in particular, have withdrawn, and the new old powers are now moving into the vacuum, and one thinks here of Russia reasserting itself. China, surprisingly, looking at its uh, lines of communication to its various economic centers. Turkey, of course, reasserting itself under Erdogan, uh, and of course we should not forget what is happening uh, in Iran. Next slide, please. So in pursuit of that, we are seeing an increasing militarization of the eastern Mediterranean. Increasing use of air power, for example, by Syria, Russia, United States. We're seeing air power diplomacy as opposed to gunboat diplomacy with the big nations, the great nations, not prepared to commit themselves with boots on the ground. But there is a problem with all this technological approach, and that is spillover. And one has to ask the question, are we empowering the underdog with the proliferation of high technology? But more regionally, of course, we're seeing Saudi, Iran, and Turkey flexing their muscles one by one. And meanwhile, the USA is de facto withdrawing with fewer and fewer ships in theater, and with Vladimir Putin reasserting his power not only economically, but militarily as well. And of course, the deployment of the two ships, the Kuznetsov and the Peter the Great, really symbolize that. 
Next slide, please. One of the factors that did come in was the concern over radical Islam. And I remind you of just uh, some of the tenets of that. It runs along these lines. It's monopolistic. Only Islam has the truth, and it has the monopoly of truth. It's absolutist. It's not relative to a particular time. It doesn't refer back to only the time of Muhammad. It endures forever and encompasses all people, and that is universalistic. And I said it applies to every single person on the planet, and who knows, maybe even Mars as well. And what it says is your duty to God is far more important than your duties or rights, uh, duties to anybody else or rights to anybody else. And we see this manifest in all the organizations I've lift, listed there. ISIS, of course, uh, operating now in the western part of Iraq, across into Syria, and now, just recently, one hopes, thrown out of Libya. Al-Qaeda, of course, we've seen what's happened there. Hezbollah, Hezbollah now operating in Lebanon and becoming almost a surrogate of Iran. The Muslim Brotherhood, hitherto very powerful in Egypt, but now dispossessed, now turfed out. Uh, and replaced by a more secular organization. Meanwhile, we have the Salafis, who are hardline uh, Muslims, and of course, Hamas, uh, who are in Palestine. Next slide, please. So there's a conflict then between loyalty to the state or tribe, and especially a problem with what we've seen as artificial states across the whole, whole area. Let me just uh, remind you that Islam has always felt in the light of the Arab-Israeli wars and various other political settlements, that Islam itself has become somewhat undermined, if not degraded. Well, after pan-Arabism has tended to lose its particular validity, Islamism has replaced it, and that is seen as a model to retain honor and to reject any sort of idea of fast Western modernization. But it does mean that those that subscribe to pan-Islamism are, of course, very susceptible to manipulation by religious and other authorities. Next slide, please. Which brings us then on to Iran. Well, as many commentators have said, Iran effectively is an Islamist superpower. Its main aim is to protect Muslims across the world, and as the, as, uh, the Iranians have said, the United States is a setting sun, and the rising sun is Iran. But we need to think that one year after the nuclear deal, really nothing has changed for Iran in either goals or indeed in their behavior. We have ignored Iran's strategy and ambitions at our peril. All Iran has done is postponed one weapon in their armory, and they've postponed it just for a number of years. So while they are sacrificing their nuclear gains, they are gaining economic and political aspirations. And if, at the end of the time of the treaty, they decide to produce nuclear weapons, well, of course, that will be very dangerous because it is likely to lead to continuous uh, proliferation across the, uh, era, across the area. Next slide, please. So nothing has changed in Iran's goals or indeed its behavior. And we, at, a, at our peril, have ignored the strategy and ambitions. We haven't controlled either the long-range missiles and Iran has recently fired quite a few of these to demonstrate its capability. Sadly, by having the nuclear deal, it's legitimized the regime in Tehran, and although the Ayatollahs are causing a considerable amount of grief elsewhere in the world, to some extent they now have legitimacy across the world. And this has been highlighted by the fact that Russia, who also seeks Iranian support for its activities in the Caucasus, has been selling some $10 billion worth of armaments to uh, Iran, including upgrades to their fighters, upgrades to their bombers, and perhaps equally as, pe as pressing or telling, the S-300 surface-to-air missile, which will enable them to area deny uh, across the whole of the eastern part of the Persian Gulf. So what it suggested is we need now to have a proper coercive policy in order to influence Iran in the future. It needs to include both hard and soft power, including sanctions. And it needs also now not to just involve the old P5 plus one. It needs to bring in local powers. And it suggested Saudi Arabia and Egypt, etc. may we be invited to join. Next slide, please. Meanwhile, Iran, of course, is pursuing its political aims right across the piece. 
Lebanon is now a close ally with Hezbollah, which is a proxy of Iran, controlling virtually everything that goes on. If you like, as one commentator put it, Lebanon is now effectively an Iranian policy under the control of Hezbollah. Meanwhile, in Syria, of course, Iran has provided considerable forces to go and help Assad remain in power. And indeed, of course, if the, com if the competition and the conflict comes to an end, then Assad will actually owe his life, really his life, to Hezbollah and to Tehran. And of course, that will put him at the mercy of Iran and indeed of Putin. Meanwhile, of course, when the war does come to an end, uh, we can expect to see Syria as both a Russian and an Iranian base. Let me look slightly closer to Iran, Iraq. Well, we already know there's a Shiite regime sitting in the middle of Baghdad, but more and more Iraq is controlled by Iran. The militias that we see operating day to day in and around Mosul are trained by Iran, and some of them are probably also provided by Iran. Of course, Iran has another angle that it is keen to do, and that is the bottom point on this slide. It's the way in which Iran and Iraq together will produce about the same amount of oil as Saudi Arabia, and thus can balance decisions in OPEC made by Saudi Arabia and make sure that they get to their own basic plan. Well, let me turn now to Turkey. Next slide, please. Turkey, of course, has undergone rapid upgrading under the AKP and Erdogan since 2002, and it is intent on becoming a regional power. Originally, it failed to get into the European Union, and as a result, it then decided to become a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. This latter organization does not require Iran, uh, Turkey to improve its democracy and gives it a far freer hand in its treatment of its own people. But this new direction, this emphasis on the Silk Road, China, etc., has created a sense of mistrust in the West. Under Erdogan, Turkey aspires to a regional and an international role with bases in Qatar and Somalia. It seeks, although we're not sure how genuine this is, a rapprochement with Israel. It has to be said that uh, Turkey in the past has been somewhat ambivalent towards its friends. Indeed, Turkey has been seen in the very recent past using migrants in order to exert pressure on Western powers and to gain control of their attitudes. Next slide, please. So Turkey under Erdogan, uh, what had happened was that the Arabs, and particularly the Turks, had felt themselves somewhat degraded and disregarded. And there has been a, a concern across the whole of the Middle East that there needs to be a new leader, someone like Gamal Abdel Nasser, or indeed maybe even Saddam Hussein. And it suggested, therefore, that a caliphate under Turkish control would control a population, a Muslim population, of 1.6 billion people with equal power and strength to, say, 1.4 billion Chinese or 1.3 billion Indians. That would make it one of the world's superpowers. Of course, Ataturk had established a secular state which was westernized and supporting, the, <coughs> supporting Europe. Forgive me. But of course, under Erdogan, the clock to a large extent has been set back towards the era of Ottomanism. It is said by some uh, commentators that he is amoral, he's a manipulator, and therefore there, is fruit, few, there are few that trust him. He uses refugees and other crises to, attend, uh, to achieve his ends in a very pragmatic use of power. The coup, which was supposedly organized by Mr. Gulen in the United States, may indeed in reality have actually been a plot against the army, but it is almost certain, as the BBC reported, that some 105,000 people have either been put in prison or have been dismissed from their places of work. Erdogan would like to be a nuclear power, although maybe he'll hold fire on that for the time being. <coughs> but his aim, nevertheless, is to motivate, is to unify the Middle East under his control, Africa, Europe, and even eventually the USA under some Islamic uh, banner. Next one, please. We then come on to the maritime uh, developments in the Eastern Mediterranean, and there are three issues that I think we just need to consider before we look at the practical steps, and they're these. First of all, we need to get cooperation in the Eastern Mediterranean over things like terrorism, 
uh, how to control terrorism, report it, and how indeed at a more civilian level, how to coordinate search and rescue. How do we coordinate gas exploration? And how do we agree get agreement over the exact lines of the, e of the economic communities, economic, uh, exclusive economic zones, forgive me, exclusive economic zones? Well, as was pointed out, Cyprus is at the geographical center of these activities. And it's really for Cyprus to take the lead in coordinating these activities. And maybe, to begin with, Cyprus and Egypt, and then Israel, and then Greece, and then invite others to join in with a bottom-up civilian and military approach. And maybe that way we can start to increase the stability in the Eastern Mediterranean for the mutual benefit of all. Next slide, please. So let me just give you a few final thoughts. We are in a period of a new era. Powers are jostling for position, and that is dangerous, because that in itself will create frictions which normally end up in hostilities. There are risks, and we need to be aware of those risks. We need to consider them, and we need to mitigate them wherever we possibly can. But in all that, there are uncertainties, and we need to be clear in our own minds how it is we're going to address this uncertain and very difficult future. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention, and thank you much, very much for attending the conference. Thank you.